Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dane DeFebo. I'm the museum educator here at the National Civil War Museum. I'd like to welcome you here for um, another one of our presentations in the Lessons in History speaker series. Uh, this presentation features Dr. Andy Masick, who is the president and chief executive officer of the Senator John Hines History Center in Pittsburgh. Um, the Hines History Center is the largest history museum in Pennsylvania and also an affiliate with the Smithsonian Institution. Um, Mr. Masick is noted for his most recent publication, which he'll be speaking on today, The Civil War in the Southwest Borderlands, 1861 to 1867. Um, he, and he, he will explain to us today, especially how this is an under studied theater of the Civil War and how it dealt with very diverse fighting forces including Indians, Hispanos, and Anglo um, individuals who were, who were struggling for survival, power, and dominance on both sides of the U.S. and Mexico border. Um, additionally, I will have a few announcements after today's presentation about upcoming events, uh, including additional speakers in the series, um, events regarding Civil War days in the Harrisburg area, and um, a little bit of, of additional information about the, the nature of our future speakers. But with no further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. An Andy Masick from the Senator John Hines uh, History Center. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming out on a, a nice sunny day uh, to be with me here to talk about the Far Western War. Uh, I mean, most of you have, I can tell just by looking at you, have done your Civil War reading, and you know about the Western theater. Uh, but the Western theater isn't the theater you think. Uh, during the Civil War, they talked about the West being on the Mississippi River. Uh, and the lands on the uh, east, uh, to the east of the Mississippi River. Uh, when they were fighting in Arkansas, they were calling that the Western Theater. But I'm talking about California, and Arizona, and New Mexico, and Chihuahua, and Sonora, and Texas. I'm talking about the real West. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, and I, I hope uh, it surprises you. Uh, now. Uh, the books that I've written in the past have been related to American Indians, Cheyenne Dog Soldiers was one of them, The Civil War in Arizona was a, a book that I wrote. I, I did a book called Half Breed about Cheyenne Indians and about uh, the Army in the West. But the only book that I've ever written that made it to the New York Times bestseller list was the biography of Dan Rudy, Pittsburgh Steelers, and the NFL. Uh, so I appreciate you guys reading uh, my, my real history. Now, uh, just to show that I, I come by my Civil War interests honestly, uh, this is me in high school. Uh, doing uh, reenacting in Arizona, uh, where I went to high school, and I moved there as a teenager and asked everyone what happened here during the Civil War. Nobody could tell me. I said, what book can I read? There wasn't one. So I ended up writing the book I always wanted to read. Let's see here. And I went to the National Archives, where I found a gold mine of information uh, that's my wife, Debbie, by the way, who's the best research assistant you can imagine. And uh, we found lots of documents like these here, tied up in red tape. Uh, you're probably familiar with that red twill tape that all government documents were tied up with. Uh, when you were in a hurry, you'd cut through that red tape and unbundle the documents. And that's where that expression comes from. Well, we had to untie the tape that hadn't been untied for 150 years. Uh, a little puff of dust comes out when you, you open these uh, documents. And most of them were Indian depredation claims. So during the Civil War, the federal government said, we'll compensate you for any losses that you incur if uh, Indian tribes attack you and burn your house or your freight wagon, steal your 
uh, cattle or slaughter your sheep, um, we'll compensate you because we have treaties with all those tribes. And if we have treaties, that means they're in amity with the United States government. They're, they're at peace with the United States government. And so the government is responsible if they go off the reservation or if they attack uh, citizens. That's called civil war, when uh, the citizens or the wards of one country are fighting each other. Uh, and that's what was going on in the far west. There was civil war out there. Uh, Hispanos, Mexican-American people, were fighting one another. Indian tribes were fighting one another. Union and Confederate uh, Southerners from Texas and Union men from California and Colorado and Kansas and New Mexico were fighting uh, each other. So there were multiple civil wars going on during the American Civil War. But to complicate things even further, the French invaded Mexico during the Civil War because Abraham Lincoln and the Union couldn't do anything about it. There had been this Monroe Doctrine that all of you remember from high school, which said that the Americas are the United States' sphere of influence. European powers need not apply. You can't come here. This is our territory. And so the French and the Spanish and the English all stayed away from the Americas because the United States said, this is our territory. That's the Monroe Doctrine. Well, when the United States starts fighting itself and becomes disunited, well, uh, the Europeans say, hey, this is our chance. Let's go back to the Americas. We can reestablish those empires that we lost. And that's what happened. In 1861 and 1862, uh, those European powers invade Mexico. Well, Mexico is fighting its own civil war at the same exact time. Benito Juarez and the liberals are fighting the conservative Mexicans, and the French come in on the side of the conservatives. So there are two civil wars going on, north and south of the border. There are European powers uh, involved. There are Indian tribes choosing up sides, trying to figure out who's going to win this thing. There are Hispanos, Mexican-Americans, who are trying to figure out whose side should we be on. We just lost this country uh, 12 years before, and uh, you know this may be our chance to get our country back. So there are multiple civil wars going on in the West while all this ruckus is happening in the East. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. That's the cover of my book. But this was the cover we had thought to use when I talked to the University of Oklahoma Press. If, you're, if you feel like you're too far out there in left field, you're welcome to come on over here. Uh, but it's all about people. These are some of the faces of the people involved in this story in the West. And you can see they're black and white, Indian, Hispano, Anglo. They're all involved in this, these civil wars in the Southwest borderlands. Just to remind us, this is a map of the world. No human beings originated here on this continent. They all started here in Africa. And over the last uh, 20 to 30,000 years, they spread out over the earth. Uh, and 20,000 years ago, during the last ice age, the first human beings came to North America. We call them American Indians today. But uh, that's when human beings first arrived here. Nobody originated here. We all came from here, and then over the last 50,000 years ago, or so spread out over the earth. But in the 1500s, the Spanish arrived, and they've got no clue as to who's here. They're trying to figure it out. In fact, this is their view of the West. There's California, which is a big island, until the Spanish ships sailed up here, and they ran, this is the Colorado River, and they realized, whoa, California no es isla, sino peninsula. California's not an island, it's a peninsula. 
Uh, that's how much they knew. And they knew even less about the peoples who inhabited this territory. Those peoples, uh, this is, these blobs all represent different language groups. When the Spanish arrived, uh, they're Algonquin speakers and they're Athabascan speakers, like the Apaches and Navajos. Uh, they're Kirisan and Tanoan and Uto Aztecan speakers, these people related to the Aztecs. And there are human speakers, these people on the Colorado River uh, here. So there are all these different people. They didn't even talk to each other. They couldn't talk to each other. They spoke different languages. They had different customs. They had different religions. Some buried their dead. Some cremated their, bed, their dead. They were very different, and they're often at war with one another. So there are long-standing alliances and hatreds going on in the West when Europeans arrive on the scene. And they meet people like this. These happen to be human speakers living along the Colorado River. The men are six feet tall. They have webbed toes. They are, uh, they are great swimmers. They can swim across the raging Colorado River. Uh, they're powerfully built. They, they stand head and shoulders taller than the Spaniards who arrive. But they're interested in those Spaniards with their clever armor and their steel weapons and things. So they, they forge alliances uh, with them. And these are Maricopas who live on the Gila River in what is today Arizona. And they're at war with these guys here. Uh, and they have uh, pitched battles back and forth until the Europeans arrive and then they choose up sides and they use the weapons and the uh, military might and economic might of the Europeans to advance their own wars uh, in the Southwest. So this is what Mexico, after 1821, Mexico becomes a country. They cast off the Spanish. They had a, a revolution, just like our revolution, and they established the uh, Estados Unidos de Mexico, the United States of Mexico. That's the official name of uh, Mexico. And they based it on our Constitution. Uh, they saw what the Americans had done to get rid of the British, and they said, well, we can do that too. And they did it in 1821. But then, um, about uh, 25 years uh, later, the United States decided to launch a wicked war, as, uh, as Ulysses S. Grant called it. He said it was the worst war America ever fought, uh, the worst war of a stronger over a weaker nation. And he was there. He was, he was fighting house to house in Mexico City, uh, putting his mountain howitzers on top of adobe buildings and blasting his way into the city. But he knew, as Abraham Lincoln knew, that it was a wicked war. Uh, it was a war of uh, conquest uh, to gain land. And in fact, the United States took half of Mexico and increased the size of the United States by, by a third. So it's the biggest land grab in United States history. But these are the people who live there, and they become U.S. citizens all of a sudden. They speak Spanish. Uh, they consider themselves Mexican or even Spanish. Some of them were born when Spain still uh, owned that part of the country. But now they're Americans. But they're uncertain Americans. They're not sure they really want to be part of the United States. And when the rebels invade, they say, well, maybe we ought to check these guys out. Maybe they'll give us a better deal than Abraham Lincoln and the United States. Of course, what's this? Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter. What's the date? 14. April 12, 1861. And that's the uh, Oregon flag uh, flying over, the 33-star flag, uh, which... Uh, denotes Oregon's entrance to the Union in 1859. Uh, that's the flag that flew over uh, Fort Sumter. And the ripples of war find their way west. And the Texans mount an expedition and go right into the territories thinking, we're going to capture uh, California, get some ports on the west coast, and uh, 
we'll check out the gold and silver mines of Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona. You notice on this map, this shows Confederate Arizona. New Mexico was all one giant territory that included New Mexico, Arizona, and a piece of, well, Las Vegas. It was part of uh, the southern tip of what we now know as Nevada. And that was all New Mexico. But when the Confederates came in, uh, they I wanted to show you what a Confederate looked like. Well, he's too far. These Confederates from Texas, they were a rough bunch. They were carrying double barrel shotguns. They each had a brace of pistols. They didn't have uniforms to speak of, but the practical garb of the frontier. They came west, and they ran into uh, these guys. This is a California 49er. These young men in the 1840s and 50s rushed to California after gold was discovered in 1849. And they were hardy and hale. Uh, they left their farms in Pennsylvania and Illinois and Maine, and they went west to make their fortune. But uh, these guys were no milk toast mamby pambies. Uh, they were bigger and stronger than their stay-at-home counterparts. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. They're actually different people than the people who stayed at home. Uh, they uh, joined units. They had already established a militia system in California that was very well organized. Remember, California was a pretty raw place. It had just become a state a few years before, and uh, they were still fighting Indian wars uh, in the West, in, in Washington, Oregon, California, parts of Nevada. And so here they are practicing. They're forming square. This is cavalry. This is infantry in square formations in a practice contunment in California right at the beginning of the Civil War. So they are militarily prepared. Remember, there are ten times more men than women in California at this time. All those 49ers rushed out there. Uh, some women uh, followed and could be found in uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, but they, it was mostly a male environment, and all those men were military age. There weren't any oldsters. There weren't any kids. They're all military age men. Higher percentage than any state in the Union. James H. Carleton was a frontier dragoon. He's given charge of the California Column. This group of uh, California volunteers that are charged with going into the territories, confronting the rebels, uh, and defeating the Indians as well, and keeping an eye on what's going on south of the border, especially those French who have now invaded uh, Mexico. And this is what California volunteers might have looked like. These guys happen to be my sons, uh, Matt and Max. And uh, when I was a kid, you know, I dressed up in Civil War uniforms, and uh, I dressed up all the kids in the neighborhood. And when I had my own kids, they were like big dolls uh, for me. I could dress them up, uh, too. And so I dressed them as California volunteers. And here's Matt, uh, dressed as a California volunteer cavalryman. He's got the 1859 McClellan saddle and a sharps carbine and an 1840 heavy cavalry saber. Uh, and his brother, Max, uh, is dressed as an infantryman. He's got an 1855 rifle musket, the one with the Maynard tape primer. That's what they had on the West Coast at the time. Uh, and he's got all the standard equipment, haversack, um, tarred canvas, uh, uh, knapsack, uh, and he's got a bowie knife or a sheet knife in his belt that was required uh, for these California volunteers who needed that tool to survive in the desert and to cut grass for the horses that were pulling the draft, uh, the wagons, uh, with all the supplies. Uh, and you notice he's wearing the hardy e hat with the, the brims turned down. The 1858 military hat was a black felt hat, and the regulations said you had to loop it up on the right side for, um, for infantry and the left side for cavalry, and you had to put an ostrich feather in it and colored hat cords and brasses on it. Well, Carlton, 
the experienced frontier dragoon said, forget all those doodads, just uh, wear the black hat with the brim down, because those guys are going to need it in the hot desert sun in uh, Arizona. So that's what they looked like. And there's Fort Yuma on, in California. This is Arizona on this side. There's the Colorado River. There are steamboats going up and down the river. Uh, bringing supplies to the forts. Remember the Spanish had arrived uh, uh, 300 years uh, earlier and they thought they would just go sailing up uh, uh, that between the island of California and the, the west to supply their expeditions overland. Well, by the time of the Civil War, steam power had been invented and so you really could bring supply, supplies beating against the current the strong current of the muddy Colorado River, you could bring supplies upriver to forts uh, higher, 300 miles above Fort Yuma. And there's William McCleave. He's Carleton's right-hand man, and he's leading the troops into Arizona. Just uh, weeks before, he had been at uh, New San Pedro, which is uh, Los Angeles, in charge of the camels. Uh, station there. Most of you know that the United States Army, when Jefferson Davis was Secretary of War, imported camels to the United States to use in the desert southwest. They thought, hey, they work in uh, Saudi Arabia, they work in the Middle East, why don't we try them uh, in the dry wastes of the West? And so they brought these camels here. They worked fine. Uh, they survived. Uh, the horses and mules were deathly afraid of them and would bolt when they smelled camels coming. But the, the government had put a lot of money into this experiment, so they had special barns built for them, and that's a camel right there. I don't know if you can see it, but see the humps there? Oh, yeah. I think it's a Bactrian camel, that may be a two-hump uh, camel. There's a horse standing right next to it. You can see the difference in the size of that. But McCleave was in charge of the camel. Uh, heard. They used those camels during the Civil War to bring dispatches across the desert. Greek George and High Jolly, these cameleers, would bring uh, coded messages written in Greek um, or in code, uh, which they have on tissue paper and have in their hat bands, while they had false documents in their saddlebags. So if they were captured, the enemy would get the false documents and then they could eat the uh, tissue paper real documents. But when they went into Arizona, they found Apaches. The Apaches are Athabascan speakers. They had been there uh, for uh, at least a few hundred years. They actually came into the Southwest at about the same time the Spanish did. So the Spanish were coming from the South. The Apaches were coming from the East. They were being pressured by the Comanches who were pushing them ever further uh, westward. And so these Union troops run into these guys. But the Apaches were already at war with the Pimas and the Maricopas. These are Indians who grow crops and live in fixed villages along the Gila River. And when the Pimas and Maricopas caught an Apache, they would string them up with a horse uh, hair rope and fill them full of arrows as a warning to other Apaches. So there's this war going on before the Anglo soldiers even stumble uh, into the territory and mix it up with the Confederates. The farthest west action of the Civil War occurred here at Stanwick Station, 80 miles east of Fort Yuma uh, on the Colorado. Uh, Stanwick is on the Gila River. The Gila joins the Colorado uh, River at Fort Yuma. And Union Cavalry, um, the first California Cavalry, Company A, ran into Confederate Rangers riding down the Gila. Those Rangers were burning haystacks and perhaps disabling or poisoning wells as they went along because they knew that any troops coming into that territory were going to be dependent on the forage that they found. That's the fuel for their transport vehicles. And the water that men and horses and mules uh, needed. So the fighting was often for water sources. And the next best known battle in the far, far west is at Picacho Peak. 
It's on the road between uh, Tucson and Phoenix today, Interstate uh, 10, if you're ever driving through that part of the country. And there's this, this stark, what looks like a volcanic plug uh, that juts out of the Santa Cruz River Valley. And here, uh, Confederates who had captured Captain McCleave, remember the camel guy? He got uh, a little cocky. He uh, got out in front of the troops. The uh, uh, Confederates captured him, a Confederate uh, officer named Sherrod Hunter with his Arizona vol volunteers or Arizona guards captured McCleave and 10 of his men. And the Union men wanted to get McCleave back, uh, so they launched a, a three-pronged uh, strike force, uh, two cavalry in a pincers movement, and then infantry going down the center of the road, and they were all to converge at Picacho Pass. Well, McCleave had already been spirited away to Tucson and then on to New Mexico, and the, there uh, erupted a firefight uh, at the base of Picacho Mountain, they called it. Uh, the Union uh, lieutenant, James Barrett, was killed, a bullet in his brain, and two of his men were shot out of their saddles, dead. Um, two others were uh, wounded. The Confederates uh, lost uh, four captured, uh, and the rest of them beat it out of there. So that's the, the farthest west action of the Civil War. Um, and of course, the Union men were dragging um, mountain howitzers with them. They weren't actually dragging them, they put them on mules. Remember, mountain howitzers were, weighed only 500 pounds. The bronze barrel weighed 225 pounds. They put that on one mule, they put the wheels and the stock trail on a second mule, and they put the ammo on a third horse or mule. And that's how they got over mountains and over terrain uh, that wheeled vehicles couldn't go. And that's what Tucson looked like. And I like this picture because it was uh, taken in 1940. They made a film um, that came out in 1941. It was called Arizona, made by Columbia Pictures. It was William Holden's breakout film. He was 20 years old. Gene Arthur was his love interest in this. And when uh, Columbia Pictures was looking around for equipment for uh, this movie, remember this is 1940, they went to the surplus store and they got Civil War surplus. These guys are all carrying Civil War rifle muskets. They're wearing original forage caps. The drums are original. Uh, this is as close as you're going to get uh, to seeing uh, Civil War troops actually marching, certainly in the desert. Uh, but it's all Civil War surplus equipment from 1940. This is what Tucson actually looked like. And the reason I put that in is that wagon there is kind of important. Wagons were so important to the success of any military operations in the far west. Uh, the problem was you had to pulse the troops across the desert because the wells could only sustain 100 men and 80 animals at a time. And then the water would be depleted. Those troops would move on. The water would fill up again. The next group of troops would come uh, in. It was very important to guard those wells because if uh, someone poisoned the well or caved it in, then that next group could die in the desert. But there was another problem, just the dryness of the desert. How many of you have been to Arizona or New Mexico before? Oh, quite a few of you. You know how dry it is. You know how much water you have to drink uh, and how dehydrated you can get. Well, the same thing happened to their wagons. The wagon wheels shrank. Sand worked its way into the fellows or fellies and spokes of the wagons, and by the time they got to Tucson, the wagon wheels fell apart, and the wagons uh, fell apart. And so they had to stop in Tucson and cut the tires. You know, there's an iron tire that goes around the army uh, wagon wheel. They had to cut it and re-weld it a smaller diameter to fit the shrunken uh, wheel. Well, to weld a tire, you need anvils. Well, the Confederates had wisely um, 
stolen the anvils and dropped them down wells or buried them in the desert. So that held up the Union troops as the Confederates retreated across Arizona. John Robert Baylor was at the head of the Texas and Arizona troops. He's a Confederate. He is a tough customer. He spent much of his career fighting Comanches. Comanches are the horse people of the southern plains. They're fabulous cavalry, light cavalry. Um, most military men in America knew that the Comanches were a formidable foe. And the guys in Texas, like John Robert Baylor, had grown up fighting Comanches. So these guys were tough horse soldiers as well. And he's the one who came into New Mexico and Arizona first. He captured a whole Union regiment, the 7th U.S. Infantry, ran them down with his horse soldiers. Uh, the Union men uh, were dehydrated. Uh, they threw away their weapons and their knapsacks, and the Confederates picked them up, passed out along the road as they fled from Fort Fillmore, New Mexico. But soon after, there was a major pitched battle on the Rio Grande. You know, the Rio Grande is that river that cuts north and south right through the center of the present-day state of New Mexico. And there were forts and supply depots along the Rio Grande going all the way up to the Colorado border where Fort Union was. The Confederates thought the Confederates were now under General Henry Hopkins Sibley. And Sibley thought if he can capture those forts one at a time, he could get the supplies, the food, the ammunition, the horses, the rolling stock he would need to go all the way to Colorado, to the gold fields in Colorado, and then go on to the Pacific. Well, the first big fort on the lower Rio Grande was Fort Craig. And the Union commander uh, felt that if he could hold out at Fort Craig and deny the Confederates the supplies there, they'd have to go around. They'd have to go to the next fort. And each fort, they would be getting lower on food and strength. Uh, so uh, Richard Sprague Canby, the Union general, uh, massed all of his troops at Fort Craig. Now, all of his troops were uh, an interesting bunch. Uh, here, I'm going to jump ahead. Kit Carson was a, everyone knows Kit Carson. He's one of the most famous of the fur trappers uh, and mountain men. But he becomes a brigadier general during the Civil War, and he raises New Mexico troops. He's uh, married to uh, Josefa Jaramillo, uh, uh, Hispana, uh, Mexican-American woman, well-positioned. He speaks Spanish. He speaks Comanche and Cheyenne and Arapaho and several Apache dialects as well. He can't read or, or write a word in any language. He's illiterate, but he can speak five or six uh, languages. And he's well-known and respected in the West. So he raises a regiment of New Mexico volunteers. Hispano soldiers, and uh, guys like Rafael Chacon, uh, who's in the 1st New Mexico Infantry and later Cavalry. And these guys are experienced frontier fighters. Um, in fact, they have a long martial tradition that uh, descended from their Spanish ancestors. Here's a sword. You can't read it, but I'll read it for you. It says, No me saque sin razón ni me embañes sin honor. Do not draw me without reason. Do not sheathe me without honor. These guys are ready for action. They're experienced Indian fighters, but they'll fight Texans because you know what? They hate Texans. They remember that war uh, just uh, 12 years uh, earlier in which they lost half of their country and they equate Texans with those usurpers, those people who stole their country uh, from them. Now, the Texans are not to be trifled with either. Uh, this, these are the fifth Texas Lancers. I'll tell you, 
The only lance charge in Civil War history occurred in New Mexico in March of 1862 at the Battle of Valverde near Fort Craig, New Mexico. And the Texans were almost all mounted troops. They had artillery with them as well. But one company of Texans had uh, Mexican lances captured during the war with Mexico. And these lancers made a frontal assault charge at a Union artillery position, a battery with 24 pounders, uh, 24 pound howitzers. This is one of the few times in the Civil War that 24 pounders were used in combat. As a matter of fact, uh, Dane just showed me, here's a piece of 24 pounder um, case shot that was just dug up at Allegheny Arsenal in Pittsburgh, that's right. Where they made them. You can pass that around. It's got lead, it's an iron, hollow iron ball with lead balls inside of it. When it bursts, it showers that shrapnel. Remember, it was invented by Captain Shrapnel of the British Army in 1804, uh, and that's why we call it shrapnel today. All those little fragments would come flying out. They were using those at the Battle of Valverde. This battle had. Um, frontal assaults, flanking attacks, infantry, cavalry. This was a big and bloody battle. 27% of the combatants are casualties. This is a very high percentage. I mean, we're talking bayonet charges. When the Texans reached the Union line, the Texans have double-barrel shotguns and pistols in their hands and bowie knives, and they rush in among the Union men who are using their rammers and pistols and anything they can to fight the Confederates. Uh, most of the Union uh, men die at their uh, guns. It's the Colorado troops who turn the tide of battle when the Texans attack. One company, an independent company from Colorado, <coughs> made it there in time. And remember I was saying that Western men are different than Eastern men? Well, you might not believe this, but I've, I've done some research on this. And if you look at the clothing levies for Eastern and Western men and the descriptive lists for companies and regiments, East and West, the uh, Western men wear two coat sizes larger, two shoe sizes larger, larger hats, um, they're taller, uh, the average uh, size is five, ten and a half uh, inches as opposed to five, eight uh, in the east. The quartermaster general, uh, Miggs, knew this. He said the levies for eastern troops won't hold for the western troops. They're bigger. Well, what happens is when there are voluntary migrations, uh, and we're talking about uh, the, uh, the gold rush is a voluntary migration. It's not... They're not captives that are sent someplace to a prison colony. It's a voluntary migration. Uh, the people who go are risk takers, and they tend to be bigger and stronger than their stay-at-home uh, brothers and sisters and cousins. Well, uh, anthropologists who are into anthropometry, which is the measuring of uh, human beings, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, studied Mexican migrants who came north to this country. And what they, they were called wetbacks in those days. They're illegal aliens uh, today. Uh, they came to this country, they would be captured by the immigration uh, service, they would be weighed and measured and given IQ tests. Then they would be taken back to their home villages in Mexico where they weighed and measured and gave IQ tests to their brothers and cousins that stayed behind. What they found were that the people who came across the border had a higher IQ and were physically more robust and taller than the stay-at-home ones. They call this the migrantes versus sedentes study, migrants versus sedentary people. So, I'm just saying that these Western troops, whether they're Texans or Californians or Coloradans, are different than their counterparts in the East.
Well, the last pitched battle in New Mexico happened at a place called Glorieta Pass, just east of Santa Fe, not far from Fort Union. The Confederates lost, won the Battle of Valverde, but never got the fort. They had to bypass that fort. Their supplies started going down and down. When they got to the Santa Fe Trail, they desperately needed resupply. But the Colorado troops with Canby's regulars met them in the mountain passes and fought them to a standstill. Some people thought it was a Confederate uh, victory, but both sides uh, fought to a standstill. But while that big battle was going on, uh, troops, troops under John Milton Shivington, a Methodist Episcopal minister turned major, did a flank attack on the Confederate supply train, burned 200 wagons with all their supplies, bayoneted or ran off all the horses and uh, mules, and left the Confederates destitute. No supplies at all. The Confederates under Sibley had to retreat back down the Rio Grande. And by that time, the California volunteers from the west had finally caught up, so you had Coloradans, New Mexicans, Californians, all pushing the Confederates out of the territories back to Texas. Well, that expedition was so successful that Carleton turned his eye on Indian peoples. During this fighting between Union and Confederate, the Apaches and the Navajos and the Comanches had stepped up their raiding. They had always been raiding peoples. Uh, that was part of their survival strategy. It's kind of like hunting and gathering, but you're, you're hunting enemies and gathering their booty and supplies and bringing it back to your village, along with some women and children. Uh, which, who you enslave um, to replace your losses. Uh, this was very common among all the Indian peoples and all the Hispano peoples of the West. There was slave raiding back and forth, uh, so um, the Apaches especially and the Navajos wanted young boys to replace their losses and as herders for their sheep herds and cattle and horses. Um, the Hispanos, the New Mexicans, they wanted women as criadas or uh, um, servants uh, and concubines uh, for extra wives. You can't have too many wives when you're out there in New Mexico and you're trying to build a big family up. And uh, the Hispanos would Christianize their captives. Uh, so they would baptize them. Uh, so the relationship between a captive Apache or Navajo in a Hispanic family is a little bit different than slavery east of the Mississippi with African Americans, where the one drop rule applies. If you've got one drop of African uh, blood in you, you're, you're tainted, and uh, whites uh, don't want to have anything to do with you. In the, uh, in the West, uh, the Hispanos intermarried with their Navajo and Apache and Comanche captives uh, and had children and those mixed race children, they, they called them mestizos uh, or uh, the, the process is mestizaje, the mixing of races. Um, the barriers between races are blurred in the far west and so that's what's going on. But the but Carleton says to Kit Carson, okay, now that we've gotten rid of those rebels, let's turn to the Navajos and Apaches and Comanches. Because during the fighting between the Anglos, the raiding increased. There was a tenfold increase in uh, casualties from Indian raids. Um, hundreds of thousands of sheep were stolen, goats, horses, cattle. Uh, those were the, the, uh, the basis of the economy in the far west, that livestock. And so they all went to the Indian villages. Well, Carleton and Carson now launch campaigns, first against the Mescalero Apaches and then against the Navajos. Here's Manuelito, a Navajo headman, uh, next to Kit Carson. And 
they subdue the Mescaleros and put them on a reservation. Then they turn on the Navajos. They attack their villages in the canyon lands, even in the dead of winter. The Navajos had never seen anything like this before. They, they could fight small uh, bodies of cavalry, Spanish, Mexican, or uh, Anglo-American, but a whole army coming after them in the winter time when their horses are low in the flesh, when their food supplies are low, and these troops come in and they burn everything. They burn the peach trees, they uh, destroy the crops, they smash the ollas, the uh, clay pots that hold the reserve grain and food of the people, and they take away their subsistence. And those people are then herded onto reservations. This is on the Pecos River, the Bosque Redondo Reservation. These are California volunteer troops guarding these blanketed uh, Navajos. Thousands of them, 6,000, 8,000 of them are captured there. Manuelito and Barboncito, the uh, Navajo headmen, hold out in their canyon land uh, holdouts until finally they can't any longer and they surrender. Now, Kit Carson was already famous by this time. Dime novels were being written about him. The Fighting Trapper, Kit Carson to the rescue, this says. Uh, well, uh, people knew him and, uh, and he had felt like he had a reputation to uphold. He was probably about five feet, four inches tall, uh, was not a, a, a large man, but he had a huge reputation. And so uh, Carlton gives him the task of going out onto the plains to subdue the Comanches. The Comanches, there, there are 12,000 of them. Uh, they're the best horse soldiers on the planet. Uh, and they're well organized and they're militarily savvy. And so uh, Carlton uh, tells Kit Carson, I know you can do it. And by the way, uh, if you go out there with uh, 350 men um, and take two mountain howitzers with you, these little mountain guns, uh, we'll make sure that General Curtis sends you some troops from the east and you can get those Indians in a pincers movement. Well, it turns out that uh, Curtis is sidetracked by a Confederate scare in Missouri and he doesn't show up. Carson's out there on the plains all by himself, and it's by the skin of his teeth that he extracts his command after he's surrounded by Comanche and Kiowa warriors. He does destroy one whole village of nearly 500 lodges, buffalo uh, hide teepees, uh, but then he has to do a fighting retreat. He's shooting his cannons the whole time, uh, giving his men covering fire. They're firing canister loads and spherical case shot, like I uh, just handed out. And it's those cannons that save the day for uh, Carson. This picture was done by a Cheyenne warrior in 1865. Uh, and this is what the Cheyennes thought of uh, those, those little cannons. They called them uh, the guns that shoot twice, because it goes boom, and then the shell explodes, boom. And they also call them the thunder wagons, because they look like wagons. They have <laughs> wagon wheels on them, uh, but thunder. Uh, so that's how, what the Indians thought of them. These drawings were done by Plains Indian warriors. They, they're called ledger art. The Indians captured books from the army. This is an army ledger book. You can see the numbered page here, the lined paper. Um, the uh, warriors had their own uh, pictographic language, and people of different tribes could understand this, kind of like sign language. You, you've all seen sign language on television before. Uh, a Comanche could understand a Kiowa, could understand a Lakota or a Cheyenne and an Apache uh, by doing sign language. Uh, the sign language for white men is the men who wear hats, because uh, that's a distinctive feature of uh, white men. They always wear hats. The other thing that they do is they have heels on their shoes. Uh, and so 
by showing someone heels on their shoes. Uh, an Indian man or woman would wear moccasins that wouldn't have a heel. Uh, an Indian uh, would uh, walk on the balls of his foot, uh, usually turning his toes in, just as you would if you were running on the beach uh, and you were running on the balls of your feet, if you were barefoot, you, uh, you don't put your heel down, you don't plant your heel. When you plant your heel, you turn your foot out like a duck. If you ever look at your, your footprints in the sand, and so it's easy to track a white man because uh, he walks like a duck. Um, <laughs> if uh, uh, an Indian man, his toes point straight ahead or even a little bit uh, pigeon toed because he's walking on the balls of his feet. He doesn't have heels on his shoes. Hmm. This comes in handy when you're tracking people in the desert. Um, well, there's John Milton Shivington. Uh, at the same time, remember the hero of uh, Glory of the Past, the guy who burned all those wagons and slaughtered all those, uh, those mules? Uh, well, at the same time, Kit Carson is trying to extricate his command from the plains uh, with his two little mountain howitzers 300 miles to the north on the um, Arkansas River, uh, the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho village of Black Kettle, is camping near Fort Lyon. These people have been told to camp there by the army officers at uh, Fort Lyon. Uh, they told them if you put up an American flag and maybe a surrender flag underneath it, a white flag, you'll be safe there. Well, this guy uh, had raised 100 days volunteers in Denver. Some people say that they were the dregs of Denver, or all the saloon bums and uh, vagrants in town who wanted to get an army bounty and uh, wanted to uh, uh, serve for a short term, uh, they raised a whole regiment, the 3rd Colorado Volunteer Cavalry. And Shivington wanted to use them before their enlistments expired. So with one week to go in their enlistments, he took them all down to Sand Creek, Colorado. Uh, Sand Creek runs into the Arkansas River. And he knew where these Indians were. He captured any civilians in the area, like the Bent family, uh, William Bent, the great fur trader and friend of Kit Carson. Uh, he didn't want them to tip off the Indians that he was coming. And then he proceeded to attack the village. He killed uh, more than 200 uh, women and children. Um, most of the uh, men were gone. Uh, the, uh, those who survived ran up the creek here where they were gunned down with uh, mountain howitzers and small arms fire. It was the most horrific massacre of Indian people in American history. It touched off uh, decades of fighting on the plains as the Cheyenne dog soldiers uh, who were related to these people uh, stepped up their attacks on frontier forts and settlements and the Overland Trails. But it all happened here. At the very same time, uh, Carson was withdrawing from the plains. And Carson says to Carlton, hey, look, I can go back out there and finish off those Indians if you really want me to, but I'm going to need a 1,000 men and long-range rifled artillery if you really want me to do it. He didn't want to go, uh, but he said, if you send me, that's what I'm going to need. The Indians out in the West stepped up their attacks, and here's a warrior who drew a picture of himself capturing, what kind of horse is that? Can you tell who owns that horse? U.S. U.S. He's got a U.S. brand on his shoulder. He's got the 1859 McClellan saddle. He's got the 1859 bridle. Uh, he's even got the crupper uh, drawn in here. If you look closely, I don't know if you can see it, maybe in the front row you can, uh, we even see the horseshoe nails in the uh, horseshoes. Of course, an Indian would never put horseshoes on his horse. I mean, how crazy is that? Only white men would do that. Uh, I mean, those big, heavy horseshoes, I mean, hurting the horse's uh, hoof. Uh, and, and Indian warriors would travel, um, would fight naked, uh, except for a breech cloth. Uh, you don't want any clothing uh, on you or any other impedimenta, you want to travel light. Uh, you'd fight without a saddle, or maybe just a simple pad saddle or a surcingle. Uh, you don't have all the weight on the horse that a white soldier would have. 
with his carbine and saber and pistol and um, his uh, blankets and overcoats and extra horseshoes in the saddlebags. I mean, uh, those guys are traveling with 120 pounds of gear as well as their, their person. Uh, so, uh, so the Indians think very differently. You notice that this horse is dragging the 1859 pattern pick, picket pin between his legs. And what this warrior is saying is, I touched this horse with an arrow. I counted coup on that horse, coup from the French word blow, uh, saying, I touched it and now it's mine. So that's, that's what that warrior is doing. He's claiming that, that piece. Now, uh, this warrior's name is Whirlwind. That's his name. The warrior will usually put his name floating above his uh, head. And this bare paw, paw shield that he's carrying is a known uh, shield. I don't know if I have it here. Uh, well, it's, it's in a museum collection today. We know who its owner was. So we can verify that this is uh, this man. He's already lanced one man here. Uh, he's chasing these two cavalrymen. You see they're wearing their great coats and they've got their uh, McClellan saddles. Uh, these guys have been firing at him. See the muzzle blast here, that those puffs of smoke? That tells you how many times they fired. If you look over here, these are the bullets. Those tadpoles are the bullets that they fired. So uh, Whirlwind is saying, uh, I chased three cavalrymen. I killed one. I couldn't catch the other two. They fired at me seven times. Uh, count the bullets. So he's actually telling his story, and this is a mnemonic device, so he can recount the tale around the campfire. It, imagine a World War II fighter pilot coming back from a mission, and he and his wingmen have to give an after-action report. And uh, he might say, I came out of the sun, I did a barrel roll, I fired three bursts, and I splashed that zero. That's exactly what these warriors are doing. He's doing an after-action report, and this picture is helping him uh, with the details. Even the fact that this is a, a flea-bitten gray horse, and a white horse, and a bay horse, and a gray, these are all important details to that warrior, because if he gets it wrong, or if he lies, his life is forfeit in the next battle. He's bound to tell the truth. And that's why these are such important documents, because they are uh, excruciatingly detailed and, uh, and they don't lie. Uh, this uh, event happened uh, February 7, 1865 at Camp Rankin in Colorado, and uh, White Bird here counts coup on an exceptionally tall soldier. He's a non-commissioned officer. He's got uh, stripes on his uh, legs. Uh, and um, he counts coup on him with his saber. The Indians love sabers because, I mean, they're the better horsemen. They can use a saber on a, on a horse, whereas the white soldiers, not so much. They were always injuring themselves and cutting off their horse's ears and stuff. That, that's why they call that heavy cavalry saber. I don't know if you've got one here. But uh, this is the light cavalry saber. Uh, that might be... Uh, a reproduction of a of a heavy cavalry saber. Most of you probably uh, do your moulinets before you come out to limber up your wrist, don't you? Uh, well, when you're on horseback, uh, you're trained uh, to practice your cuts and your points, you know, uh, all this stuff. But they always said you could tell the horse of a new recruit because the horse's ears were bobbed. <laughs> oh, so. <laughs> It gets tiring on that wrist. That's why they call it the wrist breaker. Uh, so the Indians knew how to use sabers. Well, White Horse here goes home with all of his this guy's equipment. Here's the saber belt. There's the 1851 belt plate, the cartridge box, the percussion cap pouch, the uh, full flap holster. Here's the saber on it. He even goes home with this man's bugle with its red silken uh, cords on it or yellow cords. Only one bugler sergeant died at Camp Rankin that day, and that was Sergeant Allenson Hanchett, who was six feet one inches tall when he was 19 years old. Remember, these are big guys. And 
uh, he, when he's killed, um, the burial party said that all his clothes were stripped off him. That was typical. The Indians would take the, that clothing. That was very valuable. Except for his shirt, which they said was so bloody um, that, uh, that it wasn't worth taking. And you may not be able to see it. You can see it in my book, though. Uh, he's being shot in the head. Here's the muzzle blast. Here's the pistol. Uh, and there's blood gushing out his mouth and coming all dribbling down the front of his shirt. Here. So this is the last moment of life of this man. It's like a snapshot in time drawn by the warrior artist. Well, this is how white men uh, portray uh, their battles. This is uh, 1865. And here we see uh, mountain howitzer on a mule. We see the horse holders over here holding the horses of the cavalrymen as the cavalrymen are ringing an Indian village. Here's a rancheria here. The women and children are running off into the hills. The warriors are making a stand as the soldiers attack. That's what war devolved into in the southwest borderlands. And the Apaches, the Chiricahua Apaches, some of you might recognize this guy here, Geronimo. Geronimo. He's uh, the Donkahe. Uh, uh, the, among the Chiricahuas, there were Nednais and uh, Chehene and Chikonan and uh, the Donkahe. Uh, these are some of the, the bands within the Chiricahua nation. And these are other Chiricahua men. And they hold out longer than any of the other uh, Indian peoples in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, and you can see, look at their, uh, their foot gear here. See the little tabs on the front of the moccasins? That's another way when you're tracking a Chiricahua man. Uh, you can, the sand gets pushed up in front of their moccasins because of that little tab, mm -hmm. that toe protector that's on their, uh, their moccasins. And these all, that detail all comes out in the depredation claims that Debbie and I uh, opened with their red tape uh, at the National Archives. It's all there in incredible detail because there were lawsuits brought against the government uh, by people and there were depositions and testimony taken in a court of law uh, that recorded all of this fighting. Mary Hildo Grijalva was a Opata Indian man captured by Apaches uh, escaped from the Apaches, lived with Hispanos, Mexican-Americans, then joined the army to help track Apaches. So, multiple wars going on. Uh, he ends up the Apaches' worst nightmare. He knows where they camp. He knows where they hunt. He knows where their water holes are. And he leads the troops. And Indian auxiliaries, like the Pima Indians here, Remember that old Johnny Cash song? Ira Hayes, Ira Hayes, call him drunken Ira Hayes, he won't answer anymore. Not the whiskey drinking Indian, nor the Marine that went to war. Well, Ira Hayes was one of those men who put up the flag on Iwo Jima uh, in 1945, and uh, he was a Pima Indian. These guys are tough uh, fighters, and they hate Apaches. And the army enlists uh, two companies of them. They give them red headbands and blue coats uh, so the white troops won't shoot them. And uh, they work with Mary Hildo Grijalva, uh, that captive that we just uh, saw. And they track down the Apaches and bring the war to them until the Apaches finally sue for peace. The Pima Indians are taken. Here's Antonio Azul. Uh, he's the chief or headman of the Pimas, uh, he meets Abraham Lincoln. The uh, government takes chiefs like Tercherum of the Paiutes and Antonio Azul and um, Iritaba of the Mojaves, he's wearing a major general's uniform, and they bring them to Washington. They fire giant Rodman cannons uh, for them. They show them regiments of troops parading. Uh, they ride on railroad cars. They stay in hotels with gas lights uh, in them. And when, when they go back to their people, Iritaba says, don't fight the whites. There's just no percentage in it. He, he picked up 
a handful of sand from the Colorado <coughs> River banks. And he holds it out to his people and he says, this is the Mojave's. All the Mojave's are in the sand in my hand. And then he points to a giant sandbar in the middle of the uh, river and he says, that's the whites. You can't count them. There are so many of them. There's no use in trying to fight them. Uh, Irritaba met uh, Olive Oatman. Have, have anyone seen this picture before of Olive Oatman? Uh, Debbie and I found her depredation claim at the National Archives, still tied up in red tape, and uh, she made a claim against the uh, Yavapais, who uh, they're related to the Apaches, they're uh, Athabascan speakers. Uh, they killed her whole family and uh, uh, took her uh, captive, enslaved her, uh, her and her little sister, Marianne. Marianne died in captivity. Um, Olive was traded to the Mojaves, or sold to the Mojaves, where she uh, lived for several years. They tattooed her face in the custom of the Mojaves. Men and women would tattoo themselves. That's not some kind of punishment or, or slave marks or anything like that. that was, those are beauty, beauty marks and spiritual uh, marks. But she was uh, returned to uh, white society. She went on a speaking tour to New York, where she met up with Irritaba, uh, who was back there uh, meeting uh, uh, Eastern officials. She went on to England, to London. She went on a speaking tour around the world telling about her captivity. And these are California volunteer soldiers with Indian people. And this is the only known photo of Civil War troops in the field in the territories in the far west. I mean, you'd think that there would be more. But uh, there are a few studio shots. Uh, but this, these, this was taken in 1863 by a French photographer who happened to be traveling through the territories <coughs> documenting mining claims. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this man uh, here, Alonzo Davis. This is Captain Atchison of Company I of the 1st Cal uh, 4th California Infantry. Remember, we started out south of the border. There's Benito Juarez. He's fighting those French. He's fighting the conservative uh, Mexicans. There are pitched battles. At the same time the Battle of Shiloh is going on, there's a pitched battle at the town of Puebla between Veracruz on the coast and Mexico City. In the mountain passes, there's a town called Puebla. And on the 5th of May, 1862, Cinco de Mayo, uh, 1862, there was a pitched battle. The Mexican army, the ragtag Mexican army, some of them didn't have muskets. They had pitchforks and hoes waiting for the muskets to fall from the front rank uh, men. They took on the French army, arguably the best army in the world at that time. Uh, I mean, the United States army was based on the French army. Our uniforms, our tactics, our firearms, even our Napoleon 12-pounders were all based on the French model. Everyone thought the French were the best army in the world. Well, the Mexicans defeat them at this battle on the 5th of May, 1862. And that's why it's remembered today, Cinco de Mayo. Um, and the French install a Habsburg, an Austrian prince named Maximilian, his wife Carlotta. They become Maximiliano. Uh, e. Carlotta, Carlotta. Uh, and uh, he is desperate uh, because he's losing this war so he passes the black decree and this decree says if you're in arms if you're in league with Benito Juarez if you're found with arms or you're giving succor to the enemy you're going to be summarily executed the black decree well that sealed his own fate because when he was captured, uh, he was put before a firing squad and shot. And this is the Mexican firing squad that uh, shot him. They've all got American firearms because the Lincoln administration is surreptitiously sending arms and ammunition across the border into Mexico. Now, they don't want to be overt about it while <clears throat> the Civil War is raging because they don't want the French or the British or the Spanish or 
the Russians, for that matter, to come in on the side of the South and tip the balance of power. So they have to secretly send arms and ammunition and supplies to Benito Juarez. It's kind of like the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, and so that's what's going on. So these guys all have American uh, arms. And that's Maximilian's shirt with nine bullet holes in it. Uh, it was cleaned by his physician, Dr. Beach, who uh, then uh, uh, sent it to Maximilian's mother back in uh, Austria. Of course, Abraham Lincoln uh, is shot. These are the obsequies, the uh, obsequies, the, uh, the funeral uh, demonstration in San Francisco. Uh, so this is going on in San Francisco. And Lincoln's death changes everything in the West. When the war ends in the East, uh, Grant orders 50,000 battle-hardened Union troops to the Mexican border under none other than Phil Sheridan. And Sheridan, you know, he doesn't take any prisoners. He's, he's one tough customer, a cavalryman. He's about uh, the same size as uh, uh, Kit Carson, a uh, great horseman and, uh, uh, and a great fighter. And so the French get the message that the Civil War is over and they've got to bug out. And the French uh, start to withdraw uh, almost immediately in late 1865. And they leave Maximilian kind of twisting in the wind there. And that's why Benito Juarez is able to finally uh, capture him and kill him. Well, this is all the remains of the Civil War in the Far West today. Those are some objects that I've discovered at uh, campsites and battlefields uh, in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas and Colorado. Uh, in fact, there's one of those lances uh, from Benicia Arsenal, this one. Because the Union troops had lances as well. The Mexican-American troops recruited in California, they grew up using lances. And so uh, two companies of the Native Battalion, as they called it, were armed with lances. Well, that's my story. Matter of fact, that's me. Uh, at, at sunset uh, there, and that's the story of the Civil War in the Southwest borderlands that you didn't know, I think. <laughs> Thank you.